Hello, this is Friendly Cat, and these are some odd game mechanics and tips for you to make the most of them. First one is the weekly start date. So in January 1936, the first day of the week in game is Saturday, which would be January 4th. So if you have any activity, like a decision like improved worker conditions or an anti-party raid that is active as of Friday, January 3rd, then when the start of the week occurs on January 1st, then you will get the tick, or generally a bonus, or whatever positive or negative modifier that's associated with that activity. So you'd get the 0 .050 weekly stability. That's kind of a big deal because many of these decisions or activities have a duration in days that is not evenly divisible by the number of seven. So if you start improved working conditions on January 3rd, the Friday, the day before the start of the week, you're insured to get the maximum number of ticks. If you were to start it on the 4th, you would get one less tick. And we're going to see it in action right now. We're going to take Ideological Loyalty, which has a weekly manpower of plus 500. So when I fire it off, we're going to see it in action. It is going to give us that 500 manpower, not on the second, not on the third, but on the first day of the week, which is the fourth. And just like that, as soon as the fourth comes, we get 500 manpower. It doesn't matter if I started this on the first, second, or third. Once the fourth hits, then we would receive it. Now, does this really matter all that much? Not really. You know, about half the time you'll get the maximum number of ticks for your decisions or events anyway, because if you start in the middle of the week, there's a good chance you'll uh, still get the have enough ticks, enough duration to hit that extra tick. But it can make a difference, particularly if you're targeting, trying to get that 50% war support during a war, particularly an offensive war. Your stability is going below 50%. You're potentially facing strikes or draft dodging, so it can make a difference. The weekly start date moves one day forward in March 1936 from Saturday to Sunday with the leap year, and then it moves again one day more four years later and the next leap year in 1940, and then of course one day forward in 1944. So for the first two months, you'll want to start activities generally on a Friday, and then you'll move forward one day to Saturday if you want to maximize the number of ticks. The next five tips all relate to odd mechanics with resistance and garrisons and how to make the most of it. So I've gone into the console and annex the Soviet Unionist Tanatuva to demonstrate. This is not a full uh, overview of resistance and all the different garrison policies. It's just a few items. But we do need to go over some basic concepts. We'll go from least complicated mechanics and tips to the most complicated. Resistance is bad. It's just really bad. It's, uh, it's awful. Uh, as the resistance target rises, you'll need to increase your fulfillment. That means the number of divisions, generally manpower and infantry weapons and support assigned to that area, and also the damage to fulfillment goes up, and it gets out of control very quickly for the most difficult achievement runs with Tanatuva as the Siberian Tiger, or uh, Maku Mai Dei, finish them. Your low manpower can absolutely cripple you as you watch your resistance go up, so we do need to very much monitor it, and I do think resistance is an odd mechanic as it currently exists in the game. So the first tip and the, maybe the easiest one that most of you may already know, the simplest one, is to research military police because that increases the suppression bonus by 20%, which effectively means you'll need less fulfillment, less manpower and equipment, again, generally infantry weapons and perhaps some now support, than you would need it without military police. Without military police, of course, you don't use support equipment at all usually. And we're going to get there through a multi-step process. We're going to burn 35 army XP to pick up proper heritage. So our cavalry unit design cost is down to 100%. We can modify cavalry related templates for free. So I could put this as create empty. And then without costing additional army experience, we could fill it up with cavalry and it won't cost army XP. And I've already done this. And uh, many of you, if you've seen my other playthrough guys, you've seen me do this over and over and over again. So one thing I'll show because I think it's so important. So you'll build a division that looks something like this and it will cost 
zero army XP to make the division, but it will cost 35 army XP to take proper heritage. And then once we've completed it, we generally go out into professional officer corps. Now this division all by itself isn't all that isn't that pretty or that spectacular. It's just as good as a single battalion, but it's set up for no military police. So when you have finally researched military police, we will add that military police support company onto this division. I generally change the template, uh, picture to that little tiger or bear or whatnot, and call it Milit police military police. I still need to work on that naming convention. And then we can see up here how much this helps the overall fulfillment need. The overall manpower per suppression is now down, I think it works out about 18% or 17%, which is quite a bit. And then the production cost goes down as well. So that means we have less manpower and less infantry weapons, and we do have to pay for support, but overall the production cost is now lower, which just by itself is fantastic. If that's all this did, this would be worth it. But because the fulfillment is lower, that means the damage to both manpower and our production is lower as well. This is really, really, uh, really big thing. And I hope that um, this one tip helps you along the way. As we move on to the second tip, we're going to make it a little more complicated because we're going to look over just briefly the four best ways to deal with resistance. I'm going to go from worst to best. So the worst, the fourth worst of the best ways has to do with local police. And I should clarify, what I mean is when you're in a war, you're in a small country, you're short on manpower, you're short on equipment, and you're fighting for your life, you need every division possible at the front line. So local police works really well when you're at peace, or if you have a large, you're a major, you've got lots of infantry weapon, lots of manpower, then yeah, absolutely go local police. That's, I think you can probably live with it. But as resistance rises, that resistance target rises here it's going for 17 percent but as it rises to 20 25 30 35 particularly if you're at war so you don't have the minus 10 percent controllers at peace bonus maybe the enemy is capitulated so they get another 10 percent and they might be exiled might be looking at 5 10 15 another i guess a bonus to them but a malice to you you could comfortably see local police with resistance levels at 35, 40, or above. At that level, the fulfillment is so high that you'll be putting a lot of manpower and IC into that zone, and then the damage is pretty high as well. So we like local police, but it's the worst of the best. The next best is actually martial law. If you're doing martial law, great job. You're doing fantastic. I'm really proud to pat yourself on the back because martial law works really well. And you'll see me use martial law quite a bit when resistance goes up above 35% or so um, due to local, when you have local police, pop over to martial law and that will drop the resistance target almost always to 10%, actually always to 10% or below. And as you hit 10% and below, fulfillment drops drastically versus 40%. You're looking at about a 25% fulfillment requirement versus 40 percent and damage is reduced as well significantly as resistance continues to drop below 10 percent fulfillment does not change but damage does reduce so good job if you are using if you use military it could be martial law when you're in battle you're doing a great job i'm, I'm really proud of you the next best is not to play the game at all so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna deal with it all i'm gonna go no garrison because i have no garrison I have no required garrisons. I have no fulfillment need. That means all of my manpower, all of my IC goes right to my army. This is a legitimate strategy. Uh, when I do Italy attacking Ethiopia, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go no garrison to release all the manpower and all the IC, the infantry weapons, so they can go into the army so we can quickly capitulate Ethiopia. Uh, we've got to beat that fellow, uh, their leader from getting on the train, and it's Haley Selassie. Yeah, there you go. Haley Selassie from getting on the train and escaping Ethiopia. Now that's its own odd mechanic. But in any case, we need to take care of this really quickly. So it is absolutely appropriate to go no garrison when you're in a fight. Uh, as Canada attacking USA, we would go no garrison. And you may see me in a lot of my playthroughs in the difficult runs. I'm going to be sitting on no garrison because even though I'll have a higher resistance target, I need manpower and I need IC right now. And the IC will, the resistance will eventually tick up to really high numbers, but it's still good. The 
best of the best when you're in a real tough fight. I will actually get to you in two tips because it's a little bit complicated. The third resistance tip is actually kind of cool. This I think a lot of people know about is that no garrison says no compliance gain. What it actually means is no compliance change. That means compliance will neither gain nor go down. It will go up or go down. That's another reason to use compliance. Usually it's the compliance percentage, or compliance strength, that's the hardest one to raise. So if you got uh, you know, 40, 50, 60% compliance on a, on a territory, let's say you're France and you're just struggling, Germany's just pushing you back, it's really difficult. Italy's pushing in, you need manpower, you need equipment, you need another division out right away. Uh, go for it, go, go no garrison. You're like, oh my goodness, if I go no garrison, then these colonies that I've got with that really high, or the occupied land with that really high compliance, I'll lose compliance. You won't lose compliance because although it says no gain, it actually means no change, no change. So no garrison is really cool. That's, that is an odd mechanic. It probably should have a, a loss of compliance, but nonetheless, it's a tip that says we should really be considering no garrison. Now we'll move on onto the fourth tip. And the fourth tip is the trick of this whole thing. And I see quite a, um, quite a few posts that seem to indicate that if you are in, I'm gonna let the, I'm gonna let tick for a day so we can get the pop up here. Oh no, I'm on no garrison, that's why I'm not seeing it. I'm gonna go local police force, let it tick. When we see this, oh my goodness, 400,000 manpower missing, 494,000 infantry equipment, Oh, must be disaster. I'm gonna get revolts and resistance, uprisings everywhere, and it's just gonna be a bad time. But it isn't. If you ever play this, if you ever play it out with this horrible manpower and equipment deficit and just let it go, you may notice that you don't actually have problems at all. That's because of this really additional odd mechanic, and it has to do with how fulfillment works. That if you do not have fulfillment, it will give you military governor for free if you're hearing me on this it's a little bit complicated so i'll just try to talk it out that the actual resistance target is affected by a couple different values but it's also affected by your um, your what's it called your default law what, what law you're choosing but also your fulfillment now right now where we are right now it is determined that moscow has fulfillment. So I'm getting the local police, the effects of local police, a negative 15% to resistance and uh, the compliance malice of only negative 0.02%. But as we move around to other areas, let's wait for me to let this thing run for a little bit and let the let it tick itself out. And there we go. Now it's now it's it's updated itself. And it's determined that I have a 0% garrison fulfillment, which does make sense. I'm Tanatuva and I used the console to annex the Soviet Union. So I have so sh I'm so short on mowing power and so short on infantry equipment that I am making no garrison fulfillment. Local police force effect scaled by 0% to garrison fulfillment. We would expect that negative 35% at the end to actually be plus 40%. We would expect resistance to be stronger if I have no garrison fulfillment, because I'm effectively at no garrison, right? If I have no garrison fulfillment, I'm at no garrison, but I'm not. The game says, hey, because you're at local police and you're trying, we're gonna give you military governor for free. Military governor has a negative 35% resistance. And as I hover over, you can see I'm getting, with 0% garrison fulfillment, I'm getting negative 35% resistance. That's interesting. But let's take a look at compliance as well. And this actually uh, makes it a little easier to see. Compliance, I'm getting compliance growth. I have no no garrison for a moment. I can't meet it. No manpower, no infantry. I shouldn't get compliance growth, uh, but no. And I'm getting a malice to compliance growth of 0.04%, which not coincidentally is the same as military governor. Now on this screen, it says 0.045, uh, but it doesn't, doesn't show that thousands of a place when we actually go over and look at Moscow. I'm getting military governor for free. That's huge. 
So maybe the best way to play the resistance game, if you're gonna if you're in a tough situation, like Mako My Day, uh, Siberian Tiger, low man parallel infantry, is not to worry about it at all. But simply choose local police, don't go with no garrison, choose local police, and then let the game give you military governor for free. This is an odd mechanic, and maybe at some point it will be adjusted, but for the moment, don't worry if you see extraordinary high numbers there. And interesting enough, as your fulfillment goes up, you'll actually see the resistance target go up if you're using local police, because local police has a lower resistance number. Right now you're seeing a negative 35%, local police is only negative 15%. That brings us on to the fifth tip, because this is the most complicated one. Well, okay, cool. So what I want, what you might be thinking, perhaps correctly, is okay, what I want is I want to see local police and I want to see no fulfillment. How do we get that? How do I continue? How do I make that happen? Well, it's a two-step process. The first is to go to no garrison, suck everything out, and then deploy a bunch of troops. Um, See if we can let it tick for a little bit. Let it tick. Okay, perfect. So now it's registered and I've sucked up a bunch of infantry equipment and some manpower as well. So this sucks whatever whatever infantry equipment or manpower was being used for resistance now just got sucked out. And here I'm limited by my um, army size, so I can't make more divisions. But in a regular game, you let it tick, let it run, you know, a week, a, couple, a day or so just to make recruitment troops, but maybe a week or longer to let the troops on site. Uh, you're actually armies that are in battle, get the manpower and get the equipment that was previously tied up in the resistance and then go back to local police. And now when you go back to local police, you know, we already were at a horrible fulfillment. Now we're at even more of a horrible fulfillment because we sucked the manpower and infantry equipment out of those potential resistance garrisons out of the vault, out of the bank, and put them in our troops, in our army. So that's the first step. The second step, you say, okay, cool, but I, but my factory is, uh, I mean, we only have one, oh, actually, we've got quite, we've got nine factories making infantry guns now. As these guns are made, won't some of those guns be put into resistance? Some of these guns be put on military police, and we know we actually don't want that. We want all the guns, all the weapons to go to our troops. So how can we make that happen? Well, that relies on a very interesting odd mechanic within the resistance area, excuse me, within the recruit and deploy. You see five different areas, and each of those areas are different uh, identity uh, activities or different extra areas would be garrison operations, supply trucks, upgrades, and reinforcements. When we choose garrisons on the lowest level, it says take garrisons last, lowest priority. And the rest kind of works similar. Operations, I generally put it at high priority because um, when I'm running an operation like collaboration government, I want to make sure that gets taken care of first. But we can leave the rest on medium. And if we leave the rest on medium, as long as there's a need within the uh, deployment queue or active troops, no incoming infantry weapons will go to the garrison. I'll say that again. Because it's the lowest priority, infantry weapons will continue to flow only to the queue or to the active troops. Now you might be thinking, well, I don't want them to go into the queue. I want them to go into active troops. I'll take it to this. I'll take reinforcements and put it to the highest. That way, I want to make sure my active troops get, get the high priority. That's not a bad idea. But it seems like what's actually happening, when you click high priority here, it actually puts the reinforcement queue on low priority. So active troop goes high, reinforcement goes low. So as long as you have a deficit in the field, and let's be realistic, a lot of times we do have deficits. And this is showing a positive right now, but because it hasn't um, ticked up the resistance. But in reality, many times we will have a, res uh, a deficit in the field, and so that's fine. But if by some chance you take care of your active deficit and you want to make more troops instead of all of the infantry equipment going into the queue some of it would go to garrison so you know a couple weeks later you need to go back to you no know, garrison let it run for a couple days to redeploy and re and then go back to here and go back to local police 
So, you know, doing this every couple of weeks could be a little tedious. So we'll set it to medium priority and by setting it just like you're seeing here, this will ensure that anytime you do an operation that will get the highest priority, which to me is really important. And by setting garrison to low and everyone else at medium, garrisons will only get infantry equipment if there is not a shortfall either in the deployment queue or the active troops queue. It of course does mean that active troops queue will be competing with deployment queue for reinforcement like in infantry weapons, but I still think that works out pretty well. Well, that wraps up the last of the odd mechanics for resistance, and I hope these tips make your life with resistance just a little bit easier. The next two tips are related. They involve pair dropping without an air force and naval invading without a navy. So I think a lot of people know about the first one, how to do paratroops, pair drops without an air force, but I do see sometimes questions on videos and indications like, I can't understand, how do we do a pair drop and what's the air superiority work? Well, it's uh, kind of straightforward. So if we were going to want to pair drop, for example, into France, we do not need to have our planes providing air supremacy over the zones, over the air zones. All we need is a lack of enemy superiority or enemy supremacy. That's what the game's checking. And you'll often see that when we do drops into London, pair drops into London, I'll do no Air Force pair drops because London or England does not put an Air Force up in France or Belgium or wherever my airfield is. They don't put an Air Force up here and they don't put it up in England. And if they don't put up their air, I won't put up my air. And because the game engine isn't checking for my supremacy, they're checking for a lack of enemy supremacy, the pair drop will go off. And we see that a lot of, um, I think to see that with a lot of like World Conquest, like World Conquest is Tahiti, World Conquest is really small nations where they join the Axis and use no pair drop, it could be no Air Force pair drops into France to capitulate France and then either pop it, or somehow take control of France and then from there continue their World Conquest. But the second tip is a little more complicated because we can do no navy naval invasions. Yeah. Um, if you saw my Siberian Tiger, you probably saw that. Again, many of these tips are things you would have, you may have seen in my other achievement runs. So uh, now in this case, of course, I've uh, continued along from when I annexed the Soviet Union using the console. But if I was going to do a Siberian Tiger, or when I did, I naval invaded from the Soviet Union into China without calling the Soviet Union, without having a navy, of course, and without calling the Soviet Union in. Because the game is, again, not checking for your naval superiority. It's not look checking for your naval supremacy. It's actually checking for the lack of enemy naval supremacy. It's also checking during a naval invasion for the presence of ships. And it's a little more complicated than that. But the biggest thing is the presence of ships and the lack of enemy naval super superiority. So if I'm going to naval invade into China and China is at war with Japan, that makes Japan the enemy of my enemy. So it's checking for the enemy of my enemy. Now, if I have a navy, I'm also the enemy of my enemy, but Japan is also the enemy of my enemy, which means Japan, even though I'm not in their faction, I'm not friends with them, Japan will provide the naval supremacy I need to do a naval invasion into China. Now, of course, I had to watch the sea zones and see where they are. If they've decided to cover these two sea zones, then, what is that, Sea of Japan and the East China Sea, then I need to naval invade down here because they're not in the Yellow Sea. But if they cover Sea of Japan and East China Sea and Yellow Sea, well, then, then I can naval invade through this area. If you like these types of tips, please feel free to leave a comment down below, or if you want tips of different types of game mechanics, I'm glad to provide. Hope you have a great day. Thank you very much for watching.